On the first Good Friday, Jesus was crucified, driven to a brutal death on an ancient torture device known as a cross. He was driven there by a world that could not abide his expansive love. Jesus' love was so universal it challenged conventions and shocked the world. When he died, it was like love itself was crucified. We call this day good because it is holy. We call this day good because despite the suffering and mourning experienced on the first Good Friday, there was also a miracle of self-giving love, a miracle of a person who is fully human and fully God offering himself in sacrificial love for us all. Today, we worship with a cross behind us, but not the artistic, well-polished one that normally adorns the wall behind me, Instead, we worship with this rough-hewn cross that is more like the one Jesus would have carried, a cross that is worn by the weather and splintered to the touch. With this cross beside us, we will hear seven passages of scripture read through the lens of the apostles. We will see Jesus through their eyes, experience him as they might have experienced him. After each scripture reading, a song will play, a meditation prompt will appear, and a striking artistic vision will enhance your meditative state as you dwell with Jesus on this day, as you journey with him on this day. As you prepare for worship, consider bringing a holy object into view, perhaps a cross or a candle. Bring also elements for communion, bread to break and wine to pour if you have them, or some other food and some other drink that is closer to hand. Whoever you are, wherever you are, and whatever you bring to the cross of Jesus Christ, let us go on this journey as we worship God together. From the beginning of his ministry until the end, Jesus lived his life in a way that would lead to his death on a cross. In the Gospel of Luke, the story of Jesus' adulthood and his ministry begins in chapter 3. Luke foregrounds the story by mentioning the emperor of Rome and the Roman governor of Judea because Jesus would eventually die at the hands of the Roman Empire. And he begins with the story of John the Baptist, whose powerful preaching and radical love were too much for the authorities of his time to bear. John pointed the way to Jesus and prepared people's hearts for Jesus, indeed in both his passionate life and his untimely death. John foreshadowed the ministry of Jesus. Our first reading is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 3, verses 1 through 22. In the 15th year of the reign of Emperor Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea and Herod was ruler of Galilee, and his brother Philip, ruler of the region of Ituria and Trachonitis, and Licinius, ruler of Abilene. During the high priesthood of Anas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, as it is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. John said to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers! Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits worthy of repentance. Do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, what then should we do? In reply, he said to them, whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none. And whoever has food must do likewise. Even tax collectors came to be baptized, and they asked him, Teacher, what should we do? He said to them, Collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. 
Soldiers also asked him, and we, what should we do? He said to them, do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusation and be satisfied with your wages. As the people were filled with expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So, with many other exhortations, John proclaimed the good news to the people. But Herod, the ruler, who had been rebuked by him because of Herodias, his brother's wife, and because of all the evil things that Herod had done, added to them all by shutting up John in prison. Now, when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. There were many disciples in Jesus' life, but there were 12 who stood most closely beside him and worked with the greatest urgency to proclaim the kingdom of God. Some of these 12 had been disciples of John the Baptist. Before they heard John pointing the way to Jesus and saying that Jesus had come to be God's Messiah. Were some of those disciples in the congregation during the reading that we are about to hear? In Luke chapter 4, we hear the first words Jesus spoke as an adult in public ministry. Words that declare a love so expansive that some in his audience cannot bear to hear it. Jesus came to be a Messiah for the rich and the poor. Jesus came to be a Messiah for people born in his nation and people born in foreign lands. When this congregation hears that he is not just here for them, they attempt to drive him off a cliff. It would not be the last time his radical, expansive love brings the threat of death upon his life. Our second reading is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, verses 14 through 30. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read the scripture, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him at that point, and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, Is this not Joseph's son? 
He said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, Do here also in your hometown the things that we have heard you did at Capernaum. And he said, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up for three years and six months, and there was a severe famine over all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them except to a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of the town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. In the final week of his life, Jesus prepared a meal for his disciples and invited them to the feast, a meal that may have reminded them of previous dinners with him. In our next reading, Jesus dines at the home of a Pharisee, where he sees people seeking seats of honor at the banquet. However, he proclaims that the way of the kingdom is different from this. A citizen of the kingdom of God does not seek to serve her own pride or her own sense of dignity. Instead, she seeks the lowest place and seeks to offer herself on behalf of others. And when she is the host of the banquet, the citizen of the kingdom of God invites everyone to the feast. She does not focus on her friends or on the rich and powerful, on those who could return the favor, favor and grant others besides. Instead, she invites a different kind of guest to the banquet. Our reading is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 14, verses 7 through 15. When Jesus noticed how the guests chose the places of honor, he told them a parable. When you are invited by someone to a wedding banquet, do not sit down at the place of honor in case someone more distinguished than you has been invited by your host. And the host who invited both of you may come and say to you, give this person your place. And then in disgrace, you would start to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit down at the lowest place so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. 
Jesus also said to the one who had invited him, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors in case they may invite you in return and you would be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame and the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you for instead you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. One of the other dinner guests on hearing this said to him, blessed is anyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. In our next reading, the 12 disciples are sent out into the world. For the first time, they preach, teach, and heal on their own. They come back to Jesus full of excitement, their hearts and minds brimming with reports of the deeds of power they have done. How strange then, that immediately after this, they have difficulty imagining Jesus feeding more than 5,000 people in a miraculous way. But nonetheless, this is what happens before their eyes. How strange then that immediately after that great feeding, they are unwilling to listen to Jesus as he describes his messianic mission, how he came to suffer and die on behalf of all people. Surely by now he would have established credibility with them and they could more willingly hear even a strange message such as this a message that calls them to take up a cross and follow him, a message that calls them to give themselves and self-sacrificial love each day as part of their own journey. Nonetheless, this is indeed what he tells them. How strange then that immediately after proclaiming that message, a few of them see the miracle of Jesus transfigured on a mountain. And if they had any more doubts about listening to this Jesus with his strange message of radical giving, of universal love, of losing yourself in order to find yourself, the voice of God thunders from the cloud saying, this is my son, the chosen, listen to him. Listen to him. His message will cost him his life, and following it will cost you yours. But there is a new life to come that is better than this. Our reading is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 9, verses 1 through 35. Then Jesus called the twelve together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases, and he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. He said to them, take nothing for your journey, no staff, nor bag, nor bread, nor money, not even an extra tunic. Whatever house you enter, stay there and leave from there. Whatever, wherever they do not welcome you as you are leaving that town, shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. 
the disciples departed and went through the villages, bringing the good news and curing diseases everywhere. Now Herod the ruler heard about all that had taken place, and he was perplexed because it was said by some that John had been raised from the dead, by some that Elijah had appeared, and by others that one of the ancient prophets had arisen. Herod said, John, I beheaded. But who is this about whom I hear such things? And he tried to see Jesus. On their return, the apostles told Jesus all they had done. He took them with him and withdrew privately to a city called Bethsaida. When the crowds found out that they had gone there, they followed him. And he welcomed the crowds and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who needed to be cured. The day was drawing to a close. And the twelve came to Jesus and said, Send the crowd away so that they may go into the surrounding villages and countryside to lodge and get provisions, for we are here in a deserted place. But Jesus said to them, You give them something to eat. They said, We have no more than five loaves and two fish, unless we are to go and buy food for all these people. For there were about five thousand men. And Jesus said to his disciples, Make them sit down in groups of about fifty each. They did so, and made them all sit down. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, Jesus looked up to heaven and blessed and broke them, and gave them to the disciples to set before the crowd. And all ate and were filled. What was left over was gathered up, twelve baskets of broken pieces. Once, when Jesus was praying alone, with only the disciples near him, he asked them, Who do the crowd say that I am? They answered, John the Baptist. But others say that you are Elijah, and still others that one of the ancient prophets has arisen. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered, The Messiah of God. He sternly ordered and commanded them not to tell anyone saying, The Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised again. Then he said to them all, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will save it. What does it profit them if they gain the whole world but lose or forfeit themselves? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words, of them the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. But truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. Now, about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep, but since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood there with him. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him.
When Jesus was dying on the cross, he cried out from the depths of his soul for God to give him mercy. Did he know at the time that his sacrificial love would be a sign of God's mercy for us all? For Jesus, an indelible expression of God's unconditional love was mercy. In this passage, Jesus is merciful to a woman who is a notorious sinner, a woman whose presence elicited shock and disgust from the good, polite people he was dining with on that day. But the mercy of God is for people such as her, and for people such as you, and even for people like the person you have difficulty forgiving. Our reading is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 7, verses 36 through 50. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and took his place at the table. And a woman in the city who was a sinner, having learned that he was eating in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster jar of ointment. She stood behind him at his feet, weeping, and began to bathe his feet with her tears and to dry them with her hair. Then she continued kissing his feet and anointing them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw it, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what kind of woman this is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. Jesus spoke up and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. Teacher, he replied, speak. Jesus spoke up and said, A certain creditor had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debts for both of them. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the greater debt. And Jesus said to him, You have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has bathed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore I tell you, her sins, which were many, have been forgiven, Hence she has shown great love. But the one to whom little is forgiven loves little. Then he said to her, Your sins are forgiven. But those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. By welcoming people like the notorious woman who bathed his feet at the banquet, or the tax collectors who find, found mercy and hope for a new life at his feet, 
or the untouchable people who found his touch to be a healing balm in and of itself, Jesus was upending the social order, calling the lowest people to the highest places and the highest people to the lowest. It was inevitable that the powers that be would not tolerate his presence for long. His words were too revolutionary, too empowering for people at the bottom of the ladder, people who needed to be kept in their place. His actions were threatening to the established powers, to the people at the top of the ladder who desired to keep their place. Eventually, he would bring his revolution of expansive love and sacrificial giving to the heart of power itself, to the city of Jerusalem, to the seat of economic, political, and religious power in his time and place. Once he was there, he would have one, one last meal with his apostles before one of them would betray him and the powers that be would come and take him away. Our reading is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 22, verses 1 through 23. Now the festival of unleavened bread, which is called the Passover, was near. The chief priests and the scribes were looking for a way to put Jesus to death, for they were afraid of the people. Then Satan entered into Judas, called Iscariot, who was one of the twelve. He went away and conferred with the chief priests and officers of the temple police about how he might betray him to them in a secret place. They were greatly pleased with this plan and agreed to give him money. So Judas consented and began to look for an opportunity to betray him to them when no crowd was present. Then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover meal for us, that we may eat it. They asked him, Where do you want us to make preparations for it? Listen, he said to them, When you have entered the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house he enters, and say to the owner of the house, The teacher asks you, Where is the guest room where, my, where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, already furnished. Make preparations for us there. So they went and found everything as Jesus had told them, and they prepared the Passover meal. When the hour came, Jesus took his place at the table, and the apostles with him. He said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. At that time, he took up a cup, and after giving thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves, for I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And then he took a loaf of bread. He took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he did the same with the cup after supper. And he did the same with the cup after supper, saying, the cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But see, the one who betrays me is with me, and his hand is on the table. For the Son of Man is going as it has been determined, but woe to the one by whom he is betrayed. Then they began to ask one another which one of them it could be who would do this. See you. 
body that is broken and shared with you, a cup that is poured out representing the new covenant in his blood. During this last supper, the apostles must have known that danger was on its way. They were told that a betrayal was coming. They must have known that their teacher was too good, too loving to be allowed to live. The paradox of Christian faith is that it is in losing ourselves that we find ourselves. In seeking ourselves and maintaining ourselves, in serving ourselves and preserving ourselves, in honoring our own pride and our own dignity, in serving our own needs above all others, in these things we lose the most essential part of who we are. It is in giving, it is in loving, it is in honoring others that we find the most essential part of who we are. It is by giving a part of ourselves, a part of who we thought we were supposed to be, that we take up our cross each day and follow him. And it is in taking up our cross and following him on a path that leads first to crucifixion that we find our way to resurrection. In this path that leads first to crucifixion, both his and ours, we find our way to resurrection, both his and ours. Our final reading is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 23, verses 26 through 49. As they led Jesus away, they seized a man, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming from the country. And they laid the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A great number of the people followed him, and among them were women who were beating their breasts and wailing for him. But Jesus turned to them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For the days are surely coming when they, when they will say, Blessed are the barren, and the wombs that never bore, and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if they do this when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two others also, who were criminals, were led away to be put to death with him. When they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right hand and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing. And the people stood by watching, but the leaders scoffed at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself if he is the Messiah of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him that read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other one rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus replied, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, while the sun's light failed and the curtains of the temple were torn in two. Then Jesus, crying with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. When the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God and said, Certainly this man was innocent. And when all the crowds who had gathered there for this spectacle saw what had taken place, they returned home beating their breasts. But all his acquaintances, including the woman, women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. <laughs> 